In this video, I'm going to make a VGA controller out of a number of simple parts, such as EEPROMs and flip-flops. I'm hoping to achieve half VGA resolution, which is 320 pixels by 480 pixels. I have some ongoing projects that I want to add a video controller to. I want to turn the Turing Z80 into a ZX Spectrum, and I want to turn the Turing 6502 into an Apple II. I have a video series where I go over Rust generation in a lot more detail, and I particularly recommend this if you're interested in how WAS generated the NTSC signal for the Apple II. But this series is two and a half hours. I want to try and cover the important points in 10 or 15 minutes. Now, Rust generation is actually a topic close to my heart. I have a number of academic papers on the topic, and this middle paper has over 200 citations. You might be thinking, well, why didn't you join NVIDIA? Well, the short answer is I did. I was in the architecture group, and I worked with the team that designed the raster generator for the Tesla and Fermi class of chips. These were used in the GeForce 8 series to 500 series of graphics cards. Why use an EEPROM as a raster generator? Well, if you look at the designs of these TTL CPUs, they have rather large EEPROMs in them. The typical clock cycle for these machines starts with a static RAM read. We then do an EEPROM lookup. Let's the output from the EEPROM into some octal D-type flip-flops. Then on the positive edge of clock, we write a value back into the static RAM and update our notepad address. The important thing though is that the EEPROM is only used while clock's low. When clock's high, the EEPROM is actually free. If I can, I want to use this time for raster generation for these two processes. I'll start by building a raster generator alone, and then I'll try and add it into the processor design. To understand how raster generators work, we need to go back to cathode ray tube technology. There's an electron gun at the back of the tube, which can generate free electrons, which are accelerated towards the front of the tube. At the front of the tube, we have three different types of phosphor, and these glow different colours when they absorb the electrons. On the side, we have some electromagnets, and these allow us to steer the electron beam left, right, up and down. The electronics in the television or display use these electromagnets to sweep the beam from left to right and top to bottom. We call this sweeping a raster scan. We also have the ability to turn the electron beam on and off. In computers, this on and off pattern is coordinated with a dot clock. When viewed from the front, we sweep through the pattern and we turn the electron beam on and off so it makes a picture. We build this picture one line at a time. Each of these lines is called a scan line. The flyback at the end of each scan line is controlled by a signal called horizontal sync. Then when we finally hit the bottom right, Another signal called vertical sync takes us back to the top left, and we start again. For standard VGA, this whole process happens 60 times per second. Each frame has 525 lines, and each line is 800 pixels wide. Now, not every pixel is visible. Only 640 by 480 pixels can be seen by the user. The other values shown here tell us how wide the sync pulses need to be and where we should put them. I'm going to start by turning my EEPROM into a two-dimensional array. Address lines A0 through A9 are the column address, and address lines A10 through A19 are the row address. You can think of this a little bit as being a variable declaration for a two-dimensional array. But as is actually the case for 2D arrays, it's just a contiguous piece of memory. Of this 1K address space, the display takes up 800 columns and 525 rows. The active area of the display, which is the bit seen by the person using it, only takes up 640 columns and 480 rows. This gives us three regions, the unused region, inactive, and active. To control the beam, we want to add a horizontal sync and a vertical sync in the inactive region. At each pixel location, we have 32 bits of data. 20 bits tell us the location of the next pixel. 
We have red, green, and blue for a test image. And finally, we have a bit each for H-Sync and V-Sync. Note that these signals are active low. Screen location 00, 00 corresponds to EEPROM address 0. We have three bits corresponding to the red, green, and blue values of the pixel at this location, and then the address simply points to the next pixel in memory. Column 1, row 0, then points to column 2. Column 2 points to column 3, and so forth. We keep going till we get to the end of the scan line. So at column 799, instead of pointing to 800, we go to location 1024, which is the start of the next scan line. We go through this process again for the next scan line, and then we keep on doing this until we hit the bottom scan line. Then for the pixel located at column 799, row 524, we set the next value to be 0. This takes us back to the start of the image. I'm going to start by making a board which contains two EEPROMs and four output latches. The address lines of both EEPROMs are tied together but the outputs are all independent. There is a common clock though, which updates the outputs at the same time. I'm going to use two 27C322 EEPROMs. These are each 2 meg by 16 bits, so the board will have 2 meg by 32 bit storage capacity. That's actually larger than I need, so I'll end up tying A20 to ground. I manually place the chips on the circuit board, but I used an auto router to lay down the tracks. This is what KiCad predicted the board would look like. Note that the pin headers are pointing in the wrong direction. This is the actual board I had made up by PCBWay. Now, they don't sponsor this video or any of my videos, but I've been very happy with them. I'll solder in some sockets for the EEPROMs. I wouldn't recommend this soldering technique unless you're quite experienced, but it is very quick. You need to be hyper-vigilant for any bridges that might occur. I'm going to solder the Octal D-Type flip-flops directly to the board. I'm using male pin headers, but here you can see I've got the female attached already. Now what I want to do is reroute 20 of the address lines coming out of the Octal D-Type flip-flops back to the address lines on the EEPROMs. The red, green, and blue signals I'm going to put through a resistor network to feed the monitor, and H-Sync and V-Sync just need some inline resistors before they go to the monitor as well. This is a very simple circuit. I'm going to mount my printed circuit board on some Vero board, and I'll manually wire in A0 through A19 using wire wrap wire. These address lines feeding from the output back to the address line inputs actually form a 1 million state finite state machine. It is actually possible to have the entire active image take up contiguous memory locations. Write in the comments if you think you know how. Here are the three resistor networks that form red, green and blue. I'm going to use this 25 megahertz oscillator for my primary clock and a 74HC74 to divide the clock in half. To generate the EEPROM, I've opened up this Microsoft Visual Studio project. I've already put in some code for reading in a bitmap image. Now, I can't remember exactly where I got this code from, so I'm not going to show it, but there's plenty available out there on the internet. The first thing I'm going to do is encode all of these VGA timing signals as hash defines. Our reprom size is 1k by 1k. I'm going to use bits 20 and 21 for H sync and V sync. The positions of red, green, and blue within our word. Because these are read in as bytes, but we're only displaying 3 bits, there's 5 unused bits. When shifting the values into position, I have to take these 5 bits into account. Horizontal sync start and horizontal sync end. Vertical sync start and vertical sync end. Again, these come directly from the tiny VGA specifications. I'm going to define two data structures, both 32-bit unsigned ints. One is our working memory, which I've just called EEPROM, and that's a 1K by 1K 2D array. But the second data structure is called EEPROM image. This is just a single 1D space, and it's representative of what we're actually going to program into the EEPROM. 
Now, I'm not a huge fan of the native layout of the 27C322E prom. This interleaving of data bits just drives you nuts while you're debugging. So I tend to reorder them. To do this, I need to rearrange the data bits within a word, and that's what this swizzle data routine does. It moves the bits around so that they appear contiguous on the output pins of the EEPROM. Next, because I only have 9 bits of colour, I'm going to need some dithering. Instead of just truncating the lower 5 bits, I'm going to compare them against a random number and then either round up or round down. It's a bit crude, but it's better than no dithering. I'm going to add my main code here because the handle to device context has already been defined. By default, I'm going to get each memory location to count up by 1. This is the left to right sweep of the scan line. Now I need to wrap around the right edge of the scan line at column number 799 so that it points to column 0 of the next scan line. I'll quickly hash to find right edge is 799 and bottom scan line is 524. Now I need to connect the bottom right pixel to the top left pixel. The horizontal sync signal is active low, so I'll set it to be high for every pixel except those within the HSync region. I'll do the same for VSync. Now I want to copy in the image from the bitmap. The variable PTR points to the raw data in memory. I read in red, green and blue, dither them, then write the data into the EEPROM memory. Now I want to generate the final EEPROM image. I copy the data across from my two-dimensional array, and I make sure I swizzle the data as I do it. Now I want to check that I haven't made a mistake. I'll generate an infinite loop. I read off red, green, and blue. In hardware, this structure is actually called a finite state automata. That's why I've called it FSA output. And now I can set a pixel on the display to show the contents of red, green, and blue. I apologize for the use of so many magic numbers. I know a lot of people don't like them. It makes the code less readable. But I find it much easier during debug to see the actual number. Once the code's actually running, I usually go back and fix them all up to make it more readable. I also want to make sure my HSync and VSync signals work. Finally, I look up our EEPROM and use this to set the next FSA output value. Let's compile it and see if it runs. Okay, that doesn't seem to work. Ah, I want to set the upper three bits, not the lower three bits of each color. This is exactly where I find magic numbers to be helpful rather than named constants. I also want to display red, green, and blue, not blue, green, and blue. Let's see if this works. Didn't know what time it was, lights were low, oh, oh. And just as a side note, we can see our nice wide H sync signal and a relatively thin V sync signal. So this is full resolution VGA. This has a dot clock of 25 megahertz, so that means we have 40 nanoseconds per pixel. The EEPROMs I'm using have a minimum access time of 50 nanoseconds, so full VGA resolution is not going to work. I'll try dropping it down to half VGA resolution, which is 400 pixels per scan line. That gives us a dot clock of 12.5 megahertz and 80 nanoseconds per pixel. It's pretty trivial to change this. I just change the right edge to be 798 instead of 799, and I count up by 2 every clock cycle instead of 1. Let me try this. This looks good. It appears to be skipping every second pixel. I wrote some additional code to dump our EEPROM image data structure out to disk, and I programmed it into a pair of EEPROMs. Now let's see if it works. There's a Starman waiting in the sky. And there we have it. Starman on a VGA monitor. That's it for this video. I'll integrate it into the Turing Z80 and Turing 6502 designs in the upcoming videos.
So don't forget to like, share and subscribe.